You're listening to the Unlocking Africa podcast. Um, Naturally Tribal Skincare was started because my son had severe eczema from birth. The way I'd put it, Tessa, is be aware of culture, but do not let it be a hindrance for moving forward and doing business. That's my philosophy around that. Yes, of course. I mean, I don't like that phrase, CSR. I don't like corporate social responsibility. (laughs) It's just responsibility. I just believe that that's a phrase that we sometimes use as companies and we don't sort of live up to it. And it's almost charitable, if you know what I mean. Stay tuned as we bring you inspiring people who are unlocking Africa's economic potential. You're listening to the Unlocking Africa podcast with your host, Tessa Adamu. Welcome to the first episode of the Unlocking Africa podcast, where we find people who are unlocking Africa's business potential. For our first episode, we have a very special guest. We have serial entrepreneur, Shalom Lloyd, who is the founder and managing director of Naturally Tribal and co-founder and chief strategy officer of EMQT. Yeah, so thank you so much for having me. I love the way you introduced me, right? Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and no pressure being the first as well. <laughs> well, I couldn't afford <laughs> of a better guest to have for our first podcast. So yes, thank you for accepting the invite. So how are you today? I am absolutely fine. Thank you. Doing well, doing well. That's fantastic. So, you know, I've seen your journey. I've seen your relentless grind and how you've managed to build two Two very successful companies are doing business in Africa. I actually don't think that my intro has done you justice. So please feel free to introduce yourself and just tell us a bit more about who Shalom Lloyd is and what you do. Oh my goodness, I wear so many hats. So where should I start? Um, It was a great introduction and thank you. My name is Shalom Ijoma Lloyd. I am the founder of a company called Naturally Tribal Skincare and also co-founder of an amazing company called Emerging Market Quality Trials. I am first of all a mother of five amazing children. I have three biological kids and three stepchildren. I'm a wife and I'm a businesswoman. That's the order of priority as it comes for me, really. I like that order. Yes, it's just the order comes in. First of all, my biggest job in life is to be a mother. Um, so in terms of the companies, I am the founder of Naturally Tribal Skincare, or as you said, Naturally Tribal Group, because it has many arms to it. Um, Naturally Tribal Skincare was started because my son had severe eczema from birth. It took me four cycles of IVF to have my twins oh, and then yeah. to give birth to these amazing twins. And one of them has severe eczema where he would scratch till he bled. And I wanted to be in a pharmacist by qualification. I respect the values of medicines in our lives, but for my newborn, particularly after being pumped with chemicals myself, I wanted to find a natural remedy to soothe his pain. And I started mixing in my kitchen with shea butter as a base, stumbled across the Eureka formulation. Three days later, Joshua's skin became what it should have been from birth. That was the breath of Naturally Tribal Skin Care. I mentioned that shea butter is uh, the base for my products. I needed to find a sustainable source of shea butter. My heritage is Nigerian, so I went back to my roots to find shea butter. And Nigeria, by the way, is one of the, if not the, highest or largest producers of shea butter on this planet. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. across the amazing place called the Kingdom of Esan in Niger State, the northern part of Nigeria. Fast forward today, we have a great facility, a factory there where we manufacture shea butter. We also have JE Oils, which I'm part of, manufacturing shea butter in Abuja as well. So now I have a sustainable source of shea butter from Africa, bringing it into the UK to make my products. So that's one arm of my brain. (laughs) (laughs) And the other side is really, I am a scientist. I spent uh, six years in the former Soviet Union and got my BS in MSc in pharmacy. Um, Still passionate about the industry, passionate about bringing miracle medicines to patients. I left the industry in 2018 and co-founded a company called Emerging Market Quality Trials. Black people make up billions of the population on this planet, but less than 3% of us are involved in clinical trials. EMQT is the bridge between the pharmaceutical industry 
and Africa. So that's a long-winded way of introducing myself. <laughs> so I apologize. Oh, no, that was a fantastic <laughs> introduction. Because, you know, it's one of those things where a lot of people have probably seen your recent successes in terms of having your products from actually tribal stocked in prestigious stores such as Harrods. They've probably seen you winning all these awards. So it's always great to know, you know, in terms of when, why, and where the journey began. So as this is the Unlocking Africa podcast, I think I'm going to get straight into it. You've kind of touched upon it, but what I'd like to know is, of all places, why Africa? Why did you decide to start doing business in Africa? I think the question, Jessica, for me is why not? Exactly. Um, I am proudly British African or African British, depending on who I'm talking to. It depends on which one comes first. <laughs> I'm just being completely honest. Um, I was born in Nigeria to amazing parents who are natural entrepreneurs. Um, my parents were educated here in the UK. So our roots have always been sort of between both countries and, and, and these continents. Yes, I yes. honestly never thought that being in the UK for the past sort of 30 odd years, that I would go back to Africa. That really wasn't the plan, as it were. After I graduated from university, when I returned to the UK, I started my career in the pharmaceutical industry, an industry that I have loved for over 25 years. Building a career in drug development enabled me to work from the ground up, from entry-level roles to leadership roles. And I started to lead teams locally, globally, across six countries, manage budget-led innovation projects, etc. It was an extremely successful career. So Africa didn't even feature. I think it was really these two companies that I mentioned, Naturally Tribal and EMQT, that have somehow made all my roads to lead back to Africa. Okay, so would you say it was the two companies or the spirit of Africa that drew you back into the continent? Which ones came first, the companies or the belonging of being African that drew you back to the continent? Oh, if you know the tribes in Nigeria, right? Yes. Um, yes. You know the Igbo tribe. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm an Igbo woman, so it certainly wasn't the passion for Africa. It was the business. <laughs> and you're a great businesswoman. <laughs> So it was that that led me. The passion and the love for Africa came later, but it was the business that drove me to Africa. So, you know, you've touched upon your heritage being Nigerian, being Igbo. Do you think understanding the cultural side of Africa was an advantage when you decided to start doing business in Nigeria? So um, the fact that I didn't have really plans from a career perspective to go back to Africa, go back to Nigeria. It does not mean that I am not proudly Nigerian. Yes. I am proudly Nigerian. I love my roots. I love my heritage. My Nigerian or African heritage gave me the grounding from a cultural perspective, mm -hmm. the love and appreciation for family, the understanding of the strength of community and belonging. I was raised, and in fact, raising my children now, the culture, you can see the African, the Nigerian culture in how I raise my children. So that has always been there and been extremely, extremely important for me. But as a woman, I know that I'd always been a rebel, rebelled against the stereotype where my role appeared to be predefined. Yes, I understand. I could have been boxed into being seen and not heard, so the culture is very, very important to me. I guess it's the way I'd put it, Tessa, is be aware of culture, yes. embrace yes. culture, but do not let it be a hindrance for moving forward and doing business. That's my philosophy around that. Okay, no, that's a great point. Stepping outside of that in terms of your heritage and the culture in terms of it contributing to your success of doing business on the continent so someone who isn't aware of the culture or isn't very familiar of the culture you know i have a lot of conversations with businesses who kind of are interested in doing business in africa but because they're not aware of the culture even the geography of specific african countries they don't tend to know where to start so for you did the cultural element play a part in 
where you decided to start your business in Africa? Culture was certainly a catalyst. Culture has helped me to actually be able to navigate Africa. Yeah. Now, let's take a little bit of a step back and look at Africa as a continent, right? Yes. Between, I think it was 2013 and 2020 last year, it was said that emerging markets or emerging economies were forecasted to grow three times faster than developed countries. Mm -hmm. Africa is an emerging market. Africa is ripe. Africa is ready. You have the population, you have the resources, you have the know-how, you have experienced professionals, you have natural resources. So the attraction there is twofold. For me, from a cultural perspective, it was easy because... Yes. I know the culture. I can speak Pidgin English. I, I, I know the, the way that my people, regardless of which African country you're talking about, you know, you walk in there and it's like, ah, how you day? You're, you're okay. <laughs> you're, you're sexual there. Now, from a business perspective, you see the potential of this continent. From a, regardless of sector, look at agriculture, look at tech. Um, so it's balancing both for me and doing that dance. If people are, I think people are cutting in on now. People are really savvy. Africa is the next frontier. The UK prime minister said so in the, um, what was the event that was earlier this year? Yeah, yeah. I think that was the Africa Investment Summit. Prime minister talked about Africa as the next frontier. It definitely is. So, you know, you've touched upon some of the key elements in terms of growing population, growing middle class, growing economies, which is great. And it's definitely positive. And, you know, we're both very much African optimists and we always look forward to the future and positive progress and prosperity of Africa. But on the other hand, we also need to be aware of when doing business, not just in Africa, but internationally, there's risks and challenges that come with that. You know, what were the initial challenges for you when you decided to do business in Africa? What what challenges did you face that people should be aware of if they're venturing into doing business on the continent? Wow, that's a, is that a trick question? And can I be as transparent as possible? Oh, be as transparent as you like. <laughs> this, is, this is a big one. I mean, every country, every continent has its own challenges when it comes to business. Africa is no different. Yes. I have a huge passion for Africa. Like I said, I see the opportunities. However, there is the other side of things as well. The challenges, the frustrations. There's something I say to people that once I land at Murtala Mohammed Airport in Nigeria, I leave everything British about me on the plane mm -hmm. and I put on my African armor because cutting corners is a norm. That That is, let's just be clear, cutting yeah. corners is a norm. Um, it is a huge challenge. First of all, okay, let me, let me go back. Being a woman is, <laughs> is a huge challenge. Being a businesswoman, being somebody who wants to be taken seriously and be heard. Um, Africa is a man's world, really. If we're being honest, it is a man's world. And then you layer on top of that, you're a woman, you want to do business in this challenging environment. You layer that, you know, people, let's, let's not forget the C word, corruption, you know, okay. and that actually goes hand in hand with cutting corners. People see things in the here and now. You know, when I'm in meetings here in the UK, people talk about what's your short, medium to long term goals? What's your five year strategy? <laughs> when you go to Africa, you have to take that hat off because people want to make money and do things that would actually have an immediate ROI. When I say immediate, I mean the next hour, in the next day, in the next week. So when you go there as a business person and you're building something with legs that you feel should have longevity, you have to be aware about the mentality that people have. It's a huge challenge. Yes. And that's because people on the ground, although you have a lot of ample resources, capable resources, the infrastructure on ground does not enable people to be able to see past the here and now. Yes, yes. And people will say, what infrastructure? You know, working in the agro sector and working also in the healthcare sector, logistics is a huge problem. You know, the basic things, the roads, electricity, fuel manufacturing, like we have a manufacturing plant in Essen and in Guabalada, 
generators. I mean, you're building something, you have to build a generator because electricity is a problem. So those bare necessities, those boxes are not necessarily ticked. And that's a huge challenge for any business, yeah. local or international companies looking to go there. You have to go there with your eyes open. 100%. So you touched upon creating something that has longevity. So it could be said that getting started is pretty easy in comparison to sticking around and lasting. So what have you done differently to ensure that you're here today and not gone tomorrow, basically? Oh, gosh. Again, you asked the most difficult question. <laughs> I mean, starting in Africa is, let me, for lack of a better word, let me say it's easy to start because yes. you have the funds, you have this idea, you want to bring it to life, et cetera. But one of the biggest ish, ish, and that challenge is maintenance. Mm-hmm. How do you sustain it? How do you keep it going for the next 15, 20 years for the future generation, right? It's resilience, it's tenacity, is actually not giving up. And it's showing people that if you do things differently, this is the impact, this is the output. Because people are hungry to learn. They want to learn. Yes, yes, yes. So it's, for me, first of all, is that people. Getting the right people with a bit of the right mindset, because it'll take a while to get them to where you want them to be. Um, investing in people and getting people genuinely to understand that you're here for the long haul because they're also used to here today, gone tomorrow. Yes, yes, yes. So it's about getting them on board um, with your vision, how you're seeing it and actually painting that picture of what the future looks like. At the same time, addressing the here and now, which is their immediate problem, but you also have to paint a picture of what the future looks like, where this is going, how it will benefit self, which is a very big thing in Africa. I mean, we'll talk about having that community spirit, but people want to sort themselves out for before they think about the wider community. Everyone must eat. I have to chop before anybody, <laughs> you know. So that that that's how that's how it's thought about. But when you actually service that immediate need, when people say, see that you're paying them their monthly salaries and it's a bit more competitive, and it's on time, <laughs> it's on time, and you're giving them incentives like we do, you know, employee of the month, little things that we take for granted, right? Employee of the month, supervisor of the month, etc. They're getting used to those things and loving it. And then you kind of take it out of the community so they can see that they're also impacting their community. They're also impacting their local government area. They're impacting their state. So you start to paint that picture for them to see what it could look like in the long term. But maintenance is a huge, huge issue. Fantastic. So, you know, you've kind of touched upon this, but I've kind of observed that you've had to like integrate yourself into your full value chain and embed yourself into your supply chain. Can you tell us a bit more about this and why you did it and how you've done it? Oh, I would love to say that it was part of my grand master plan. It wasn't? It, wait, it seriously <laughs> wasn't. Because um, Africa showed me Pepe and I do have showed me Pepe. <laughs> Because you have to be nimble, flexible, adaptable. Um, my aim when I first went to the Kingdom of Essam was to have a facility that produces share. It's not just as easy as building the building and putting the equipment and the machinery. You have to think about the collectors. The season is between April, May and September, right? the collectors who are going to go out and collect these nuts. How do you aggregate the nuts and transport them into the facility? How do you do your quality control? Then you manufacture this stuff. How do you then package it? How do you then ship it to either Lagos or Port Harcourt or wherever port you're going to and ultimately get it to the UK or to US or whoever is buying your share butter from you? I'm a control freak. I wanted to control the end-to-end supply chain. And it's not just being a control freak. It's also because I felt in the beginning, if you want to do it well, you've got to do it yourself and show people how How to to do it it and how you want things done. Yes. And because the infrastructure is so unreliable, um, it's a huge investment, but you've really got to 
look at that supply chain, map it out, knowing that it could be fluid and know that, yes, I have to map out every step of the way and go through the journey myself several times to make sure that it's working, to make sure that it's environmentally friendly, to make sure it's sustainable, to make sure it's all these things, you know, ethical sourcing, all these things that we talk about as USPs on a daily basis. Because I want my customers to be able to come and take that journey with me and see the supply chain and how it works. 100%. So, you know, you've touched upon this when doing business internationally or in Africa, there's a responsibility to support the people and the communities in which we operate. Can you tell us a bit about the initiatives that you've put in place to support sustainability and promote corporate social responsibility in the communities that you're operating in? Yes, of course. I mean, I don't like that phrase, CSR. I don't like corporate social responsibility. (laughs) It's just responsibility. I just believe that that's a phrase that we sometimes use as companies and we don't sort of live up to it. And it's almost charitable, if you know what I mean. Good business practice is when you're you're a for-profit organization, But at the same time, you're looking after your people and you're looking after the community that your operations resides in, a community where your staff come from. That should be a given. That should Mm -hmm. not be a CSR. That should be something because you know that a happy community, a happy workforce equals productivity, equals ROI, equals revenue at the end of the day. It's simple. Everything we do is about relationships and people. Despite receiving billions in aid for several decades, Africa has not achieved the levels of economic self-determination needed to enable it to deal with its own poverty. Yes. Right? So I made a conscious decision that the aid development model being used in Africa isn't working. African nations are rich with natural resources and development potential What we need is trade. You know, there's a great saying that when you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. When you teach him to fish, you fish him for a lifetime. This model works. So I adopted what I sort of dub trade and not aid. And what trade and not aid means is that in the community, it's about trading, it's about working, it's about employment. And then it's also about looking after the people and the environment where I work in. You know, let me give an example as a share butter. You know, it's, it's okay to say, oh, we have two factories, you know, naturally tribal in SN, J oils in Guaglada, wonderful. No, but we're employing, for me, over 80% of the staff that we have are women. Yes. First of all. And then you also are able to, the share trees are very, very important. They're gold, they're money. You have to protect the share tree. People in the village chop, chop, chop down the share trees for firewood. When we produce share butter, one of the byproducts is a share husk. We're trying to convert this to briquettes to supply the local community to use as firewood so they can stop cutting down the trees. It's better for the environment. Okay, okay. When we think about um, the healthcare sector, for example, in October, we just ran a free breast uh, cancer screening and um, cervical cancer screening. We screened 450 women in Enugu with a BWS team and EMQT. 33 women with cervical lesions, 15 women with breast lumps. Raising awareness. It's about doing the right thing. I don't like CSR. Yes. I don't like charity. It's about if you're a company that's coming to Africa or established in Africa or African grown, Just do the right thing for the community and for the environment that you're working in. Is that simple? I I agree 100%. And I think people tend to think that the two are mutually exclusive, that profit and being responsible are two separate entities, whereby I believe they totally cohabit and one works off the other and benefits the other. So yeah, no, 100%. And I think what you're doing is fantastic and I've kept a close eye on it and it looks amazing. I I follow it quite closely. So you talk very much about enabling people, teaching, training people to improve personally and obviously contribute to the business. I know from past experience, 
people who have tried to operate within the agriculture space in Africa have kind of found it difficult or challenging. What kind of quality control or kind of measures have you put in place to support what it is that you're doing because you know you've had great success in terms of your naturally tribal product and you've managed to have it stocked in as i say prestigious stores such as harrods so you must be doing something right on that front what have you put in place that other people could potentially learn from oh gosh so it's the right people You know, people like myself who are fortunate, I consider myself quite fortunate because I have a good understanding of home and abroad. Yes. So you're taking lessons learned. There's so much talent in the continent of Africa and so much is untapped. It's about identifying, nurturing, providing direction, but at the same time, remaining culturally aware. We talked about that earlier. It's not necessarily classroom. But this is where empowerment comes in. You know, um, I've talked to you about what we're doing in terms of cancer research and, and, and all that, and, and also in ESAN. Um, For me, it's really about the right people. It's having the right people. It's having the patience and knowing that you have to go back to showing them how to fish, teach them how to fish. And, you know, it's a tried and tested formula. Certainly in the, in the agricultural sector, it's very, very difficult because, you know, the oil industry is kind of where it is. So agriculture is coming up there. It's quite tough. Africa has, is so on tap. You have so many beautiful rural locations. I'm talking about Nigeria here, for example, and it, it applies yes. to all of us. People are sometimes scared to actually venture in some of these rural places, right? Do you believe that Nigeria is the largest, we have the most share trees in the world. We're the least exporters. Even the share that we collect, we've only gotten about 30% of the share not that we collect, we still have 70%, but people are maybe sometimes, I think, too scared to go into those rural places. And rightfully so, sometimes of all the unrest and unsettled issues going on in the country. Infrastructure is a big one as well. We find that businesses, we have to put the infrastructure in place to ensure quality. Yes. That's a big one. You know, I didn't get any government aid or anything to build my facility or any sort of um, any support because that comes with its own challenges as well. But it's, it's really the patience, knowing what you've gone there for, knowing the right places to get it, Knowing the right people, employing the right people, having that patience and being culturally aware. Where we have the factory is in the kingdom of Essan. They're Nupe people, they're proud people, they're amazing. I don't speak their language, I speak Igbo. But for me, it's about being aware of their culture, their way, their traditions and respecting that. Trade boosts development by enabling people to use resources, their skill and expertise to help themselves and improve their own future. And that's what we have at our heart, regardless of the sector that you're working in. I think that is really, really vital. The opportunities are there, but you have to be patient. You have to be aware of the culture. You have to be aware of the nuances. You have to know that there's VUCA. Yes. VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. Africa, to me, equals VUCA. If you're aware of the VUCA and you go into it with your eyes open, know it is volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. But at the end of that is a pot of gold. I couldn't have said it any better. You touched upon not receiving much government support to set up what you have set up in terms of your factory and your kind of agricultural kind of projects. We often hear that the ease of doing business in Africa is improving. What I'd like to just understand is during your time doing business in Africa or in Nigeria specifically, what have been the positive and negative, say, impacts of, say, government policies or support with regards to what you're doing? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um It's interesting because as a business person with everything I've heard, people who've had experiences, I I avoided, consciously avoided having any interactions with the government like a peg. I did. I made a conscious decision to do that. And what was the reason for that? Because 
I know that even my experience there shows that it causes more issues than it's worth. The red tape, the bureaucracy, the, sorry to say, the corruption is rife. It's there. And also for someone like myself, people believe that because if you're a black woman and you have Nigerian or African heritage and you go back home, it's a lot easier. It can be tougher because when you're mm-hmm. coming back from, as they say, the abroad, it means you're coming back with a pot of gold. You come back with lots of money. So you're seen as somebody with huge funds anyway. You know, so and people in diaspora are seen as people who have the opportunity and not necessarily being given the 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 breathing space to actually bring back stuff back home. That's a huge, huge challenge. So I avoided government, any of these banks or anything. I just wanted to do my thing myself. Now, positive side is that when you've done this, when you've built your facility or started your company and it's starting to do well and the government or people become aware of it. They show you love and they're proud of what you've achieved and they put you on a pedestal and they show you off as, look at what one of our own has put out there. Look at what we're doing. We're proudly Nigerian or proudly whatever country, Africa, right? So you get the love that way. But for me, my formula was to kind of do my own thing with my own funds and then once they realize what's happening and they become impressed with what you've put in place, which took you a lot of time and effort and blood, sweat and tears, they do champion you. Yeah, I'd say that's a very wise decision because I guess once you've proved what you're doing, proved your success, it actually puts you in a stronger position in terms of discussing what type of support that you need or even being invited to the table to discuss even if it's local, regional or national policies that support SMEs as well. So, yeah. Absolutely, Tess. I mean, on ground in Nigeria right now, um, like I've mentioned, we have the facility in Essan, which is great. Um, you know, I teamed up with a uh, group of we're four directors, JEOs, all in the share sector, right? In Wabalada, we've built this facility. In Essan, we're producing 20 metric tons of share butter a month. And in Wabalada, we're producing 400 metric tons of share butter a month. Like I said to you, Nigeria is way behind in terms of share. So now we're being seen, both J.E. Oz and Natural Capital are being seen as, you know, great pioneers who are doing things differently in the share sector in Nigeria. So that was the, the route that we took, which I'm really, really proud of because you're absolutely right. Um, you can get a seat at the table once you've proved that your model and your way of working actually works. Yeah, you mentioned that you're producing all the share butter. So what is it that you're doing with it? Does it go all directly back into the naturally tribal products or are you kind of using it for different ventures or no, a very good question so the the butter that we produce from naturally from naturally tribal nigeria and je oils in Wabalaja, um we export so let okay. me sort of tell you something really quickly about shea butter shea butter i call it it's an amazing ingredient and people don't realize if you eat chocolate you're probably eating shea butter right 90 <laughs> percent of the shea in on this planet is used by the confectionery industry the chocolate makers it's in food it's only okay, about 10% okay. that's used in cosmetics and skincare. And a bit of it is used in the pharmaceutical industry as well. Um, so it's really for export. All I need for my, my brand here in the UK is probably about two tons a year, minuscule, a very small amount. The rest we're exporting and we're selling locally, we sell it locally in the country as well, intra Africa, and exporting to US, Europe, Asia. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. And are you seeing a growth in those markets in terms of the use of shea butter or the understanding of the applications of shea butter? Oh, God, the people who know, know. Um, You know, the shea industry is a little bit hidden, but when people scratch the surface, they see this whole massive thing going on. Our problem and what we're fighting against right now is the trust. People see Nigeria as a country that doesn't produce quality, that cuts corners and that's corrupt. So although we have the share, um, you know, we're hard to do business with. And I can see why. So we saw this as a huge opportunity and thought, well, let's tackle this industry. Let's show them that Nigeria can actually produce quality share, but can do things very differently. So we're, we're swimming against the tide right now. And we're kind of break, making that breakthrough where 
you know, people look at Ghana, Mali, Burkina Faso, because they're easier to do business with. Nigeria is quite difficult. So they go for share butter in Ghana, Mali, Burkina Faso, and all those places. Whereas Nigeria has the most share butter. So we're trying to change that narrative and we're doing it slowly but surely. Okay, no, that's very interesting. So I guess something like that does take time. It's a slow process, but a very rewarding one. Can you tell us a bit more in terms of what it is that you're doing to change the perception or narrative of sourcing shea butter from Nigeria? Oh gosh, we, we are, you know, what we're trying to do is present it differently. Even simple things like your website, how you present yourself yes, to the yes. world. We're trying to encourage face-to-face meetings and Zoom meetings. We're trying to actually send out samples to people. And I say to people, well, if you're buying 200 metric tons of share butter a month, you're a key client. I'm happy to fly to the US to meet with you face-to-face. You have to show that you're investing in them as much as they will in you. Um, and that is really, really critical. Um, you know, the team, my, my, my colleagues and the team at J Oils are amazing because they've produced these um, sample boxes that look incredible. But also the fact that the share butter that comes from us is used in our products that are made here in the UK and is stocked in Harrods, made in Britain spells quality. Our yes. products will not be in Harrods, which I absolutely love, is the biggest thrill that I've had this year. <laughs> it's an amazing achievement. Yes, if they weren't to quality. So we're, we're kind of weaving all the stories through. And it's not just about giving, you know, producing share butter. It's also the fact that we're empowering women. We're giving them jobs. When you have an employee who says to you she's been able to roof her house because she's got regular employment and regular salary, and it's not just using, you know, for w- women as collectors or in 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 Guagualada in our J oil facility. Women on the factory floor operating machinery, they're women. The supervisors are women. Oh, and it, I love it. It puts a big smile on my face. So when a company works with us, they can actually see the traceability, the transparency, the empowerment. So it's not just about saying it. We believe in using the power of visuals of videos showing people what we have on ground as well fantastic so i guess it's a full package in terms of the story that you tell as well as a hard evidence in terms of you're using your own products for your range that's in harrods and also the actual functional or operational side of what's happening on the ground from where right. you're producing these products so yeah there's a lot that goes into changing that narrative and shaping how people perceive the shea butter industry in nigeria so you're probably one of their primary advocates of the shea butter industry at the moment when it comes to nigeria i mean we're both africa optimists and we love to share and communicate messages that show africa as being modern and positive whether that's celebrating technology, economic growth or political reform. But with that, I think, I believe we also have a responsibility to not ignore some of the obvious challenges, especially when it comes to things such as government policies, as they do have a huge influence on the direction of countries and the continent. I'm ever the optimist like yourself, Chester. I think Africa, like I said in the beginning, is the next frontier. Africa's yeah. future is so bright. You know, our future is also in our hands. Yeah. That's one thing. We always look externally for help and support. Our future is in our hands. Our future is in our leaders' hands. Our future is in the hands of the businesses that operate in Africa. And our future is in the hands of our people from the ground up. Which other continent has this number of young people in their population? Yeah. Bright you know, energetic, innovative thinkers. The future is so bright. The challenges will be there. The VUCA will be there. But I tell you what, Africa is the next frontier. Africa is already on the map. I mean, people see this continent as one piece. Africa is made up of all the countries with their own vibrant ways of thinking, their cultures. We're doing work, you know, uh, healthcare work, in clinical trials work in, in um, Gabon, in Congo, in Tanzania. All these countries I've had the privilege of visiting thinking we are truly one and our mm-hmm. future is so bright. We face the yes. same challenges, but our future is so bright. Let's just stop looking outward for people to come and solve our problems for us. Let's 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 solve our problems ourselves because we can. 
I couldn't have said it better. Leading on for that, you know, more importantly, where do you see yourself? Where do you see Naturally Tribal in five years' time? What's your strategy? Where, or, or what's your ambitions for five years' time for the company and yourself? Oh, gosh. Like I said, I wear, I wear a lot of hats. <laughs> there's three things. For me, Naturally Tribal in Nigeria, I want it to be a domestic name. When people hear Naturally Tribal Nigeria, they hear NTN. They know who we are. They know the impact yes. we're making. Our products are used locally and exported globally. For our J Oils facility, I want us to diversify, share butter, um, uh, granite oil, soya, moringa. I want us to diversify and expand and actually truly put Nigeria on the map as a company that is ethical and is a household name that people trust. When it comes to my skincare brand here in the UK, in, it's about seeing it in these prestigious stores. Harris is just the beginning. It's about actually showing that we're a company that has impact. For EMQT, we want to attract pharmaceutical companies into Africa. So in five years, I want to see so many more pharma companies doing clinical research in Africa. Fantastic. And I have every belief and every faith that you'll achieve that, no problem. Quote of the week. As business people, this is something that I'm probably going to have as a running theme within the podcast. So as business people, we often have quotes, mantras, even as Africans, African proverbs or affirmations that keep us going when times are hard or challenging. Um, do you have one that you can share with us that kind of gets you through the day when things are challenging? I say, you know what I'm like, when you ask people, I never have one answer because I ramble on. Feel free to ramble. <laughs> There are three principles that I believe in, in this order, right? First, start by doing what is necessary and then do what is possible. And before you know it, you've conquered the impossible. That's from St. Francis of Assisi. That is a mantra I recite to myself almost every day. The second thing is, it is better to be prepared and not have an opportunity than to have an opportunity and not be prepared. I'm always prepared. I don't know what for sometimes, but I always seem to be prepared. Africa has to be prepared. The last thing is there will always be obstacles, challenges, VUCA, barriers as we go through our life journey. However, I strongly believe that failure is an option. Failure is the first step to success. Multiple failures are multiple steps towards success. Name me an idol, a mentor, somebody you admire, look up, that hasn't had multiple failures to get to where they are t- today. In Igbo, we say, Echidime. it means tomorrow is pregnant. We don't know what is out there tomorrow. All we can do is live by these three mantras I've talked about, because tomorrow will take care of itself if we take care of ourselves. Amen. It's better to fail than to do nothing. Correct. (laughs) So, you know, as we're coming to the close of the conversation, I was wondering if you have any closing remarks or final calls to action for people who are doing business in Africa or are interested in doing business in Africa. Oh, for me is you think it, you say it, you do it. Think it, say it, do it. Uh, That's a hashtag for me. (laughs) Hashtag think it, say it, do it. We all see, we can smell it, we can taste it. Africa has potential. Africa has the opportunities. Africa has also the prostrations and you want to tear your hair out, but keep your eye on the prize because it's patient, tenacity, resilience, and you'll get to that pot of gold because yes, there is gold, a lot in Africa. Oh, thank you, Shalom. I don't think I could have ended it in a better way. So... If people want to connect with you and learn more about what you're doing, how can they do so? Oh, gosh. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, Shalom Lloyd. Um, Just type in Shalom Lloyd, you'll find me. I'm always here, there and everywhere. Um, For our share butter, it's uh, naturallytribalnigeria.com or jeoils.com. And uh, for my skincare brand, naturaltribalskincare.com, just type in Natural Tribal, you'll find us. And EMQT for the pharmaceutical side of things is emqt.org.uk. So yeah, reach out any questions. I'm happy to 
support anyone, share my experiences, share my stories. I think there is a lot in sharing and being able to support and encourage each other to see what we see in Africa. Fantastic. I definitely believe so. Thank you, Shalom, for giving us so much of your time, your valuable time, and sharing some incredible pieces of insight and information. It's been an amazing conversation, and I don't think I could have had a better guest to open up this podcast for our first episode so thank you thank you so much there's no pressure but thank you for having me <laughs> thank you so much for having me it was a pleasure thank you enjoy the rest of your day and you and we'll speak soon take care bye-bye thanks for darling peace soon bye for now thank you to everyone who has listened and stayed tuned to the podcast If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast, share the podcast or tell a friend. You can also rate, review the podcast in Apple Music. So that was the first episode. Thank you and see you next week for the Unlocking Africa podcast.